Hello everyone, in this multi-part series of videos, we shall go through a vast number of oral disorders, head and neck syndromes and oral mucosal lesions as a way of getting you to become more familiar with their presentations. For each disease condition, I will give a very short history, then I will make the diagnosis. Following this, I shall outline the treatment protocol and specific drug prescriptions if applicable. In some instances, I will also give a list of differential diagnosis. I strongly believe that these series of videos will be useful for both students and practitioners alike since it is going to be purely clinical and straight to the point without too much intricate detail. At the end of the series, or in fact during the course of the presentations, I will compile quizzes simultaneously and these will be based solely on the images in these videos. The aim is not only to test your ability to spot diagnose these pathologies, but also to appreciate their varied clinical presentations. So, without further ado, let us commence. Our first case, an 18-year-old boy with mental disability and recurrent long-lasting tonic-clonic seizures. Scar radiographs show intracranial calcifications and an MRI magnetic resonance imaging revealed an atrophic left hemisphere of the brain. On the left side of the face here, he observed this broad area of reddening together with an enlargement of the lower lip. The diagnosis for this is Sturge Weber syndrome, a neurocutaneous disorder characterized by facial capillary or venous malformations in the distribution of the trigeminal nerve. These may extend into the brain tissue, leading to learning disabilities, behavioral disabilities, migraine type headaches, and seizures. They may also extend to involve the orbital structures of the eye and manifest early as symptoms of glaucoma. Another name for this syndrome is the encephalotrigeminal syndrome, and the usual name given to these facial angiomas is the Port Weinstein or nervous flemus. It is a sporadic non inherited genetic condition and it starts to present in childhood. In fact, the frequent seizures that begin in early life negatively affects the child's neurobehavioral development, although some patients could maintain a near normal cognitive intelligence. The treatment involves managing the angiomas with sclerosins, laser, or photocoagulation. The seizures are controlled with anticonvulsant pharmacotherapy, whilst the eye complications are managed by ophthalmology. Genetic counseling for the family goes a long way. Case number two. A middle-aged man, 42 years old, with multiple asymptomatic facial skin lesions developing over a 12-month period. These have been outlined here in black ink and are scattered all over the mid and lower face. Two of them can be seen on the right lateral side of the face here. Clinical examination of each of them showed a firm lesion with pearly glossy surface and overlying telangiectasia without pigmentation. Histopathology made a confirmatory diagnosis of basal cell carcinoma. This is quite unusual since most basal cell carcinomas are usually solitary occurrences. As a result, there was a high suspicion of a clinical syndrome and further examination of the patient revealed these characteristic patterns of the palm of the hand. A skeletal survey also revealed multiple jaw radiolicenses which turned out to be autogenic keratosis. By this time, you should be making a diagnosis of the basal cell carcinoma syndrome or gold squalene syndrome. This is an autosomal dominant disorder with loss of function mutations in the patched tumor suppressor gene on the long arm of chromosome 9. The consequence of this is a hyperactivation of the sonic hedgehog molecular signaling pathway and hence the susceptibility to developing tumors or tumor-like swellings in various parts of the body, the more usual ones being basal cell carcinomas and odontogenic keratocysts. Some other manifestations will include 
intraquinal calcification of the midline Fox cerebral partition, dermal carcinosis, fibromas of the ovaries in females, malignant medullary blastoma of the cerebellum, and various deformities of the skeletal system, such as the infamous bifurcated or forked rib. The management will be targeted specifically at the various pathologies when they do develop and may be medical or surgical. The basal cell carcinomas may be managed medically using immunomodulatory agents like 5% imucimod or 5 fluorouracil creams. An orally available medication is a sonic hedgehog pathway inhibitor, the smodegib, available as 150mg capsules. Surgically, these are managed by micrographic surgery, laser ablation, or cryotherapy. Radiotherapy is contraindicated as more of the lesions could be induced by such treatments. The jaw cyst can be surgically enucleated with canine fixation or marsupialized prior to removal. In selected cases, jaw resection with reconstruction may be necessary. It is important that these patients receive genetic counseling. Case number three. This is a 36 year old man presenting with a man's history of ulceration on the tongue. He admitted to having multiple unsafe sexual encounters with different female partners, but denies suffering from any systemic illnesses. On clinical examination, a diffuse regional lymphadenopathy was evident extraorally. However, there was no fever or skin rashes. Intraorally, this relatively defined ulcerating lesion was observed on the left anterior lateral aspect of the dorsal tongue. With such an impressive historical information of multiple episodes of unprotected intercourse, a sexually transmitted disease was suspected. However, lab results returned negative for HIV and hepatitis B, but was positive for TPHA and VDRL, serological tests done for diagnosis of syphilis. As a result, the lesion was diagnosed as a syphilitic ulcer, specifically the erosive mucous patch of secondary syphilis. This patch is highly infectious and loaded with treponemal spirochetes, the causative organisms for the disease. In some instances, a multiple number of these patches may present and appear to merge together to form the so-called snail drug ulcers. But here, we only see what looks like just a solitary single ulcer. Bear in mind that the primary syphilitic shanka that precedes the secondary stage of the disease often goes unnoticed by the patient because of the lack of symptoms. Therefore, it is unusual for them to report this to you in the history. Now, as you can probably tell, the appearance of this lesion can be very difficult to clinically distinguish from a host of other ulcerative disease entities, and it is totally up to you to have a very high index of clinical suspicion. Prompt diagnosis and treatment will prevent progression of the disease to the tertiary stage, which is much more debilitating and could potentially result in the demise of the patient. The treatment is straightforward medical and typically involves the use of a penicillin-based pharmacotherapy. A typical drug prescription will be 2.4 million units of penicillin G given intramuscularly as a single dose. This is a first-line drug of choice, but in cases of penicillin allergy, a two-week therapy with 500mg cytocycline taken four times daily will suffice. Alternatively, a 100mg of doxycycline taken twice daily for two weeks is also very effective. Of course, the sexual partners, if traceable, should also be treated and the patient educated on having safe sexual intercourse. This seems trivial but goes a long way in preventing other STDs as well. Case number four. A 65-year-old West African farmer came to the oral medicine clinic with the chief concern of irritation on his lower lip that has been ongoing for at least a year now. He denies any drinking or smoking habits. He mentions that he has been plowing the local farmland and attending to livestock for the past 30 years. Clinical exam of the lip showed vermilion dryness in the presence of an area of red-white erythroleukoplakic lesion with a central focus of ulceration. 
You can also appreciate an overall thinning of the vermilion lining in an indistinct vermilion skin border. The clinical suspicion at this time was actinic chelites, and this was confirmed on biopsy. The histology showed moderate epithelial dysplasia and irregular thick elastic fibers or elastosis within the subepithelial connective tissue. Now, you may have heard some clinicians refer to this lesion by several names farmer slip, sailor slip, golfer slip. The common denominator here is that farming, sailing, and golfing are usually outdoor activities done for prolonged lengths of time with constant exposure to the sun. Consequently, the lips, like just like the skin, get damaged by the UV radiation and may exhibit premalignant characteristics. As such, the risk of risk of this lesion becoming cancerous, specifically, it could progress to a squamous cell carcinoma. Treatment may be medical or surgical. Antineoplasty creams, cryotherapy, laser ablation, or vermilionectomy as a last resort. Routine sunscreen application is protective against this lesion. 